Welcome back with family. It's Aubrey, your Festival Fairy Godmother and Event Director. And we're here with Behind Backwoods with Maddie O'Neill. Thank you so much for joining oh. me today, Maddie. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, I know you are a busy lady. And so I really appreciate you taking time to chat with us today. Yeah, of course. So you caught me at a good time. I'm I'm doing kind of a long weekend runs and then I come home for like two days at a time. So or two or You're three. Actually at home right now? I am at home, yeah. <laughs> I'm <in> wow. <laughs> How yeah. lucky. Fantastic. <laughs> well, hey, I would love to just pause for a moment and get to know you as a human. But before we do, I want to ask your permi- permission on something. Sure. Um, I sent the questions that I was planning on asking you today to your people. However, I was spent some time like geeking out on you over the past <laughs> week just to get to know you a little bit better. I mean, yeah. I've been listening to your music for a while, but wanted to get to know you as a human. And as I was watching some of those interviews that are already exist out there in the ethers, uh, some other random things bubbled up that I thought about asking you that I didn't send an email ahead of time. Are you okay yeah. with that? No yeah. worries. Honestly, I don't even care about seeing the questions ahead of time. I would actually prefer it just to be a conversation. So, Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, Perfect. So, I love it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's whatever you got. <laughs> fantastic. Well, I tend to ask this question at the beginning of every interview because I think it's really fun to see how different artists answer it differently. So yeah. if you can't use the word musician, artist, performer, or entertainer, what words would you use to describe yourself as a human? Maybe the hats you wear in your life or just aspects of yourself, maybe a little bit deeper than we wouldn't know from knowing you as an artist. Oh, I like that question. Um, I would say adventure seeker. Mm. Two words. <laughs> you can put in many words as you want, girl. Not yeah. just one. What word? Uh, I would definitely say like adventure seeker. Um, definitely a big empath. Um, uh, That's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, I mean, empath, is, <laughs> empath is pretty freaking deep. I'm an empath myself, so I love hearing you say that. So as an adventurer, what would you say was like, if you were to say the adventure that changed my life the most, what would that be? Um, Deciding to dive first into music, you know, because right? uh, it's been a crazy, crazy journey. I've started making music in 2010. Um, And it totally changed my life. You know, it's like, there's no, when you decide to go full force into this industry, there's no like off button. So it's like your career and a lifestyle and just like who you are at the end of the day. So that was definitely the one. (laughs) Right. So speaking of that, like what, what's the difference between like being a hobby producer, musician, DJ to like making the choice to go like full force. Was that like a conscious shift for you or have you always been full force since the beginning? Um, so so I started making music in my sophomore year of college. So I was still like in school kind of, you know, I was, I was studying journalism and marketing and PR. So I, I wanted to be a writer. Um, but I was like very, you know, I was, I knew that once I started doing music, that that's what I wanted to do. But, um, you know, the odds of actually turning that into a career are pretty small sometimes, you know, so I didn't, I didn't necessarily picture my, myself doing what I'm doing now. I just kind of was curious and started diving into producing first, um, first and foremost, and not really thinking about myself on a stage I was just like I want to figure out how to make what I'm hearing you know Mm -hmm. so um yeah I mean it I I think it was when I was working a shitty job at a solar energy company I was like a telemarketer at a solar energy company (laughs) 
<laughs> Girl, I sold vacuums for like a month of my life. So no shame yeah. at all. Yeah. It was like right out of college. And I was like, you know, what do I, I didn't want to get like a, a nine to five, like real job because I thought that was going to like deter from what I was doing. Um, Cause it's hard to like leave a full-time job and then go home and then it's another full-time job making music and, you know, pursuing this dream that you have. So I was doing that and um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, something definitely clicked in my brain that like it was possible. So, so I, I really dove in head first, even harder than I did in the beginning, but um, you know, you have to be practical and, and keep your job until you can actually let go of it. So, you I, know, I did a bunch of other odd things um, kind of coming up and uh, yeah, I'm very grateful that it has become a career and um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> Girl, have you heard, uh, do you know who the, the author Elizabeth Gilbert who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Do you remember that uh, book? I know the name, name, but I never read that book, no. Okay, well, she she wrote a book called Big Magic that was all about the creative process. And in it, she like uh, urges her writers or her readers to hesitate to make their art like their paycheck too fast, that it, it, that it can make it almost be like a desperation comes through in the art sometimes uh, if you're worried about like putting food on the table by your creation. Totally. Yep. So I'm curious to know what was the time frame from like when you started uh, playing with that first controller and playing with beats, like that first, that first sit down to the first time you were on a stage performing your music, what was the time frame? Um, it was actually pretty quick. Um, I, I started, I literally went to guitar center and bought a controller, like the day that I got Ableton and really just went head first. And that was when I was in my old music project. Um, so that was a duo. And then I started my solo career in 2000, late 2016. So, um, yeah, I literally just kind of started making music first based off of like what I learned on YouTube. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it was like the whole aspect of like, how do I play this live? Um, and I make music in Ableton and I also play most of my sets in Ableton live. So um, I just kind of tried to get to know the software as, as best that I could. Um, and there was an opportunity to play a show called the Raw Artist Showcase. It was in Denver, I think. And it was just like a bunch of up and coming artists and um, just kind of like applied for it and just was like, I guess I'll just play what what we have. You know what I mean? So yeah. I don't know. I don't I wish I could remember the actual timeline, but I believe that was the first show ever. And it was terrifying because I lived in Boulder, still in school, um, going down to the big city where all the music happens. Uh, and yeah, I just kind of went for it. And the, the music was absolutely terrible at that point. But like, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I wish I had like the set recorded. But I mean, it was cool. I just kind of like went for it. You know, you have to just like try things and feel them out. And, you know, you learn from each scenario. And that's kind of the mentality that I've had my whole career is, saying yes to things before you're ready for them actually. And then kind of meeting yourself at that bar. Right. Right. It's like, it's like raise your standards and the universe will meet you there, you know? Exactly. Yep. Dude. So when I was geeking out on you, I learned a little bit of your backstory coming from a musical family and that your dad was a part of a, a part of a band back in the day. And your brother was a part of, of music as well. And, and yeah. you told the story about getting your brother or the controller and then, or, or the program, tell, tell, tell that story about yeah. you know, um, how, how you got started. Yeah, it was Christmas. And, and, um, I had given, I had done some research and I knew that my brother wanted to get music software to start recording because he was always with bands, but he wanted to do like his solo thing. So 
I got him Ableton Live, which is the software that I use now. And um, he knew that Christmas how in, like how sparked I was by the electronic scene that I had discovered in Colorado specifically. So he gave me the demo version once he opened his gift. And I took it immediately and put it in my computer, went to Guitar Center, bought a controller. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, I mean, it like he he knew that I had the musical bone in me, just like my dad and him. So, uh, yeah, it was it's just kind of like a matter of <laughs> saying yes. Right. So you you've mentioned in this in just a short amount of time we've been chatting and you mentioned it in previous interviews that I watched about um, this being your second project that you've worked on. Yeah. Like so for those of us who only know you through this project was yeah. the, was the one before, uh, was it short lived? Um, what tell, tell us a, a tiny bit about that transition be between like working with someone as a duo to deciding to go out on your own. Um, it didn't end well, so I, okay. it's not really my favorite thing to talk about. Okay. Um, it, it was a five year long project with an ex partner of mine that, yeah. So it was very complicated. Yeah. We'll right. Just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will, I won't dig any, I won't dig any yeah. deeper. No, 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 no. It's fine. We, I mean, we both learned music together. We started the whole journey knowing nothing from the very beginning. Um, and that was really cool. You know, having someone else to, to bounce ideas off of and to like, you know, be encouraging in the beginning to, you know, to keep learning. Um, but yeah, I just, it was not a good situation for me. And, uh, I think leaving that and deciding to do my own thing was probably one of the best things I've ever done. I'm preach it sister preach it sister yeah. sure. <laughs> so speaking of you like coming from a musical family I want to rewind mm -hmm. just a little bit and get a little bit deeper into you as a human so did you yeah. ever uh were you ever in choir or band or musical theater did you ever do like the performing arts in your high school career before you fast forwarded to college and started that journey um I mean I took piano lessons as a kid and then I took cello in middle school um, and I I liked it, but my teacher was like really mean, I guess, because I found journals of mine that literally say like, Mr. Jackson told me this today. <laughs> so like, I think that was, I had a discouraging situation um, when I was pursuing, pursuing music in school um, and I was really into sports I played lacrosse and field hockey um in high school and I think that at that point in my life my brother was like the musician and that was his thing so I just kind of like let him have it you know what I mean <laughs> so that was kind of my, my mentality in that period of my life um yeah and I I actually I was in like a play when I was younger too, but it wasn't really my thing. Um, yeah, I used to be like really terrified of like public speaking and all of that. So it was even getting on the mic when I first started music was like a feat. <laughs> so Girl, I, I was in uh, fitness for 20 years. And so I remember like they right when I got into fitness, they made us practice putting on the headset microphone before you taught your first class because like yeah. putting on the microphone like changed everything. Did you have to like practice speaking into a microphone before you went live or did you just like dive right in? No, just kind of the more I did it, the more comfortable I got. You yeah. know, trying to like think about what I was gonna say. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or not, you know, just like living in the moment. Whatever happens, don't overthink it. Within your musical family, and in an interview, I heard that you had like a, a musical din or something like that. Did you guys like yeah. have family jam sessions? And if so, did you gravitate, gravitate towards an instrument in that regard? And if so, how did you participate in those jam sessions? Yeah, we had a, a music den in our house. It was actually really, really cool. I think I thought I had a picture of it over here. I don't. Um, 
but uh yeah there was like all kinds of drums and guitars and piano I was I always wanted to be a singer so that was like I would always grab the microphone ironically and uh just pretend to sing <laughs> or actually sing all right um, or 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 drumming so I'm, I'm a very rhythmic person as well so but yeah all of my notebooks I like like I said I wanted to be a writer I have stacks and stacks of notebooks which is really cool to read back in you know get inside my head as a as a kid um but yeah I was always like I want to be Britney Spears when I grow up <laughs> so uh, so do you ever like I mean we would love to hear your voice more <laughs> hear about you collaborating do you ever consider actually laying down the vocals yourself yeah I actually sang on two of my songs um in my early EPs or my first album the song No Master Plan, and then it's a song One in the Same off of my Parallels EP, I think. So I have done it twice. Um, I, I don't know why I haven't revisited it necessarily, but it's definitely on my list of things to reincorporate into my new productions. Oh, I would love. That's that's exciting. I'm excited yeah. to to hear more of yeah. like love to write and so on. Like I can yeah. only imagine what would come from your heart and soul if you if, right. if you open that door. That's exciting. And there's um, so many cool effects these days too that like I can manipulate and disguise it in ways that doesn't feel as raw because I'm not exactly a trained singer. <laughs> absolutely, girl. The, the, Technology is a gift in that regard, right? Yes, but I do have this this Nina rasp, especially the Tor rasp. <laughs> but it just makes it sexier, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so you're talking about having your own vocals on a song on your album. So speaking of albums, I'm curious to know, again, peeling back the onion as, as who is Maddie. Mm -hmm. What do you remember the first album that you bought with your own money as a kid or that you went after and got on your own? Or even the first album you remember owning? Honestly, I don't, but like, I want to say it was like Spice Girls. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like fully obsessed. Um, the first show I ever went to was Hootie and the Blowfish with my dad and my brother. And I was like super, super young. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember I had like tapes of Spice Girls and like. No, you had really. tapes? You had yeah, tapes? I did. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I don't feel like quite such an old lady around you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm 33. I was I'm like on the cusp of like when all of that was. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. So yes, I had remember having a Spice Girls tape. Um. Natalie and Bruglia. I remember that one. <laughs> my first, my first take was Tiffany. I think we're alone now. And so right. as, as back in the, back in the day, back in the day. Yeah. Um, so would you share with us a little bit more about your creative process? Uh, so you talked about writing and so on, but when you sit down to write music, like where do you start? Um, I kind of start all over the place. It's there, I don't necessarily have like a, I write the drums first or I write this or that, but because of the way I started producing music, I was very sample based, um, like having something to spark that initial direction. Um, I'm constantly collecting samples or recording things or, um, you know, organizing folders of like things that could spark an idea later on. So I usually start from one of those folders and um, kind of let it guide me in some kind of direction. Mm. So it's usually some kind of sample that gets me going. And, and sometimes I leave that in or sometimes I write around a sample and then I turn the sample off at the end. Um, but yeah, you it's find cool. that, that like in random moments, like you'll have like an inspiration come in that you need to go and like put it in that folder right then. So it's there when you want to go back and use it later. 
Yeah, totally. I mean, like my notes section on my phone is crazy just from being on the road and not having time to actually go and do those ideas when I want to. Um, so I'll write down songs that I hear or that, I, you know, on my Spotify when I'm listening that I want to reference or all types of stuff, you know, like but I'm always constantly trying to keep those those folder ideas like flowing because, you know, I, I don't have time to like open up a project and start that right away, but I will come back to it and remember that like feeling or something that hit me that I wanted to remember, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I usually start with something like that and see where it takes me. And uh, yeah, I think once I started doing that, and getting more organized and in just my initial ideas was what helped me keep going too, you know, Mm -hmm. or like to keep the creative flow going. Cause I, you know, organization is actually huge. (laughs) I agree 110%. You know, I'm a, I'm a conscious dance facilitator and DJ, which means it's like, it's like, uh, getting people together to dance as a meditation where like yeah. music it takes you on a wave. And uh, a lot of times I'll have music like that will come in when I'm just like listening to Spotify and I'll hear a little voice that says that song needs to be danced. And I'll go and just put it in the file of like the next, the next dance file. And then I find that when I go to build the playlist for that dance, like it's pretty much already ready. It just needs to be organized in the proper right. way. Okay. exactly yep you just have to keep the you know like I always I always call it like setting your future self up for success you know what yes. I mean? like yes. always thinking about like you five months from now or like that one show that you know so yeah yeah I totally get it <laughs> yeah I'm right there with you sister okay so we're here talking because you know you you performed it <laughs> back was this past year and so I'm a fancy at heart and that's the reason why I'm involved with with backwoods and so I'm curious to know what was the first festival that you attended before you were performing at them did you attend one it was Lollapalooza all Um, right okay in six Lollapalooza it was Daft Punk was headlining and Pearl Jam and I went down with my brother. We drove from St. Louis where I grew up and like our car broke down. It was like a whole thing. Um, yeah, that was like a mind blowing experience. Cause that's a, that's a big one to jump right into too. Um, but yeah, that's why it was so crazy for me to actually play Lollapalooza last year is cause that was like a huge full circle moment for me. Just remembering, you know, that whole experience and what my younger self would have thought if I knew that I would be on one of those stages one day. I can only imagine how your heart was exploding while you were up there as far as just like, like a coming of age moment of like, I was, I was that, I was that kid down in that audience. Now I'm here on the stage. It was, it was pretty cool. So, okay. So those of us who really are into the fest circuit know there's a big difference in your experience between going to a festival like that's a daytime festival versus a camping festival where you go and you're like in it, you know, for a couple of days. Have you, did you ever do the camping festival thing? Um, Not before I started making music. Okay. Okay. What was the first camping festival that you went to when you started making music? Um, Sonic Bloom. Well, that was the first one you played too, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I think I, yeah. I think the first time I actually went was the year that we played. Um, so go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just trying to think like definitely like slept in my car or like, had a tent situation I don't even remember <laughs> I, I so we went to Sonic Bloom I think it was in 2017 or it might have been in 2016 and while we were there I don't know if you heard of Notlo but she oh. was she was camping right next to us 
and it was right. her first festival. I'm pretty for sure it was one oh of her Oh my God, festivals. cute. And she was there in a tent. She had earned her spot. And so like, it, it, I remember being that like neighbor camper next to her and her being so excited for that first. Oh, that's season. cute. So were you in, people, in it that experience as well? It was I what? And like camping with the people and so on. Who oh yeah. Like, yeah. A hundred percent, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just like cracked wide open. It, it was actually, so the first, we weren't officially booked on Sonic Bloom. Um, we went to experience it and I, this all just came back to me. So Mikey Thunder, who's one of my good friends and an amazing DJ based in Denver, he did this thing that we had heard about. He, he would say, he would give you 15 minutes of fame. So he had, you know, an hour slot and he would give away 15 minutes of his set to some people that he believed in or to some young kids that were coming up. So he gave us his 15 minutes of fame. So we like brought all of our equipment and we were like prepared to play any sort of like renegade situation. And then Mikey Thunder gave us 15 minutes of his official set. And we played for like more people than we've ever played for. Like it was like a thousand people at the time, which is huge you know um so yeah that was that was my first camping playing sonic bloom experience you just said the phrase as, as you were introducing that story it cracked me open yeah same thing about that um it was just kind of the moment that i you know i was fully immersed in the community and like seeing what was possible and um yeah it just like I just was so inspired and kind of blown away by like what was happening because I was I didn't, hadn't really immersed myself into the community in that way before so yeah yeah that's <laughs> same with Burning Man this year cracked me wide open <laughs> In a totally that's different. on my list that's on my bucket list i probably won't make it out there until my kids are out of this house though because that's a that's pretty okay. big time investment in yes. making it out there so Never what do you play. love about playing at music festivals versus like just hitting a show what's the, what's the difference for you um well kind of like you said about the the camping festivals it's like there people become part of the community that's happening there um especially when they're there for multiple days at a time I think that people get more comfortable and then they start meeting people and relationships evolve. And um, yeah, it's like you, you, you kind of establish like a little family, um, which is awesome. And I think for artists, I, music festivals are really, really important for being exposed to new fans too. Like those are the places that people are romping around with their friends and they might just be walking by your stage and then be like, oh, who is this? You know, so I think it's really incredible that so many people just can randomly discover my music at music festivals rather than like I'm playing at a venue and they intentionally bought a tickets to something and ended up there. It's kind of like a more magical discovery environment. Preach so, it. I got chills as you just said that because half yeah. of my favorite artists, actually the majority of my favorite artists today, I discovered at a music festival and that I did not buy the ticket for, you know, you like buy your ticket for whatever reason, whether it's your favorite artist just got booked as a headliner or maybe your best friends are going and it's this new adventure you want to go on and you're like geeking out on the lineup ahead of time and being like, okay, I'm going to listen to some acts ahead of time or you just stumble into that show. And before you know right. it, you're like, how did I live my whole life so far without this music? Exactly. Yeah. And then you, you know, you find people that like the same music that you just discovered and then you have a whole new family. So <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Cool. So what are you the most excited about right now career career wise? Um well, I'm in the middle of my biggest like the biggest chunk of my touring season. Um and it, I'm doing more headline shows. I'm doing like a headline tour for the first time ever, like an actual 
longer tour than just like a weekend here or there that's my own shows. Um, and I was, I was really anxious going into it because I'm playing a lot of markets that I've never played before and I am feeling some really powerful shit. <laughs> um, things are feel like they're resonating in a way that I haven't felt before. And um, yeah, I'm just like really excited about like feeling like people are really catching on to what I'm doing and in a way that makes me feel like I have some like serious momentum and I'm inspired and it's just like this feedback loop of like okay like reassurance that I'm like on the right path you know what I mean absolutely you're getting that that confirmation of divine alignment and support from the universe and that's freaking exciting yeah it's really cool so yeah a lot of the crowds that I've been playing like people are I see people in the front row, like knowing the lyrics to my songs and shit. And that's like the first time I've ever seen that. Um, it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to make music again, too, because I'm, you know, it's a delicate balance of touring and finding time to actually create. So I think I'm going to take January off just to be able to pour all of this back into my writing because I need that right now, too. Good for you. I really honor you with that because, you know, it's really easy uh, as a creative in any, any, any form to live off of this energy of lack of not thinking that you have time to take off and take care of yourself because of the fear that if I pause, maybe those opportunities will stop coming. And I I really want to honor you in that because that takes a lot of um, self-awareness and courage to do yeah. that. And that's amazing. And speaking the power of, which, of no. <laughs> yes, the power <laughs> of no, absolutely. Um, in one of the interviews that I was listening to the other day, you commented about, um, that you have a couple different practices or uh, things that you like to practice to, help you stay in the present moment when you're on tour, as far as like you're hustling from here, this city to that city. And how do you pause to actually enjoy the present moment? Can you speak on that a little bit, or maybe share some of the the tips that you have or the tricks, the, the practices that you have? Maybe you have some up and coming aspiring artists who are listening to this who maybe could learn a thing or two about balance and presence from your example? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a big yogi, but I don't necessarily do that on the road. That's part of like my goal. Um, I did buy like a traveling yoga mat. I'm like, it's going to (laughs) happen. But I still have moments, you know, of stretching and literally just slowing down and taking deep breaths, like whether I'm like full meditating or just being aware that I need to like take a second. Um, You know, I I just had the craziest weekend ever last weekend and I had two no sleeper flights. I literally went from the venue straight back to the airport to go to the next show. And then I slept on the plane. I got in, I took a nap, I woke up, ate dinner, sound checked, and then I'm on to the next show and the next batch of people that like I'm with you know so it's 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 a lot sometimes to like have your brain catch up and also processing what just happened the night before um so yeah I mean literally just being aware of that and when I'm feeling a little bit ungrounded in those moments specifically are the times where I know that I need to take some space, you know, there can be a lot of people all the time around at shows and um, back to the power of no, like recognizing when you just need um, some silence and you need to like Zen out for a second (laughs) before you go into the next, you know, venture, because I'm, I'm giving everything I possibly can when I'm playing these shows too. And, um, you know, connecting with people and trying to be as personal as possible. And if you're not recharging yourself, it's, you know, you're not going to 
be able to show up in the ways that you want to show up. So girl, yeah. you are preaching to the choir right now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, um, I got involved with Backwoods or not involved with Backwoods, but in the place that I am now is I've been the resident yoga teacher for Backwoods for the past. Yeah. Yes, I and, did know that. Yeah. And so, um, girl, you talking about moments of confirmation. This is one right here for me is like, I, I always tell my team that one of the reasons why I feel like I'm able to be so grounded and steady, um, while, you know, we're on location and the event is going on and you're not sleeping for a week or whatever. It's because of the dedication I have to my self-care practice when I'm not there. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it becomes that fuel to keep you charged. Right. Yeah. And no, that's a really good point is because I have this practice, even if I'm not doing it at home, it creates this pattern in your brain where you can reference those moments for sure. Absolutely. And as a yoga teacher, I'd say that probably the most profound yoga that we do is when we take our, what we learn on our mat off of our mat and into the world. So that's what I'm hearing you say is that you're like taking your yogi ninja skills that you cultivated on your mat. And then you just like bring them out into how you live your life while you're on the road. And that's powerful. No, that was, thank you for putting that into words for me as a yoga teacher. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and before, before we close, I have only have just a couple more questions left. Yeah. Um, in one of those interviews, I heard you talk about, uh, I heard you talk about your pre-fest ritual or your pre-performance ritual is that you do high kicks. Um, yes. <laughs> and being from a, a, a former cheerleader as well, I have to ask, did that start as a cheerleader or as a dance team or where did the high kicks come from? Nope. I was never a cheerleader or in dance. Uh, it's literally just way to get my blood flowing. I don't know. I, get, I have like really long legs too. So I just like to like, move, <laughs> just like to move my body and feel alive, you know? Next time you're in Dallas, I would love to come backstage with you ahead of time and do your kick line with you because yes. that <laughs> would make my, I, I, that would be so much fun to come do some fun. kicks with you backstage ahead of time Um, (laughs) well I'm also a midwestern girl I I was raised in northwest Missouri seeing that you're from St. Louis right I was just curious to know um you know moving from from Missouri to Texas in in you know 20 years ago Texas is home now but there there was a big cultural change and shift for me moving from Missouri to Texas. Yeah. Colorado is still considered Midwest-ish, isn't it? If it was the vibe any different at all from St. Louis to Colorado? Colorado is such a like melting pot of people. Um, I think that people from all over ended up there. So I think there's a little bit of everything. Um, in terms of like that vibe, there's definitely a lot of Midwestern people. I wouldn't consider Colorado Midwest. Okay. West. West. Um, okay. There's a lot of that same vibe that I could feel when I came to Colorado. Definitely at CU Boulder, there was a lot of Midwestern, you know, vibes. <laughs> yeah. Just like yeah. really friendly people, you know, everyone yeah. is everyone came to Colorado to for similar things. You know, it's a beautiful state that offers so much exploration, skiing, snowboarding, hiking, you know, rock climbing, very like outdoorsy, adventurous people and also music lovers as well. So I just think that, yeah, it was, it wasn't that big of a culture shock to me and I never wanted to leave. (laughs) Well, the kindness is real and it's authentic because no, like people are super kind down in Texas and and don't get me wrong. I love, I I love Texas, but people can say the nicest thing that has, that really means fuck you. You know, like you say, Oh, bless (laughs) your heart. Oh, bless your heart really means eat shit. (laughs) Right. Totally. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that, that was what I had to get used to for sure. Um, okay. So we're almost too nice in Colorado where you're like, I wish people would tell each other to eat shit more often. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cause I like, think it's like anything goes, you know, like nobody yeah. checks each other. <laughs> That's funny. That's... Okay. So lastly here, 
as we as we wrap this up. Um, again, watching some videos, geeking out on you. I, I'm just gonna like speak to the elephant in the room because that's what I do. And if someone had asked you, what was your like the craziest experience that you've had at a music festival? And I'm like sitting here thinking, oh, don't talk about backwards. Don't talk about backwards. <laughs> no, talk that was backwards. awesome. And and of course, that of course that was what came out of your mouth. I'm like, oh, so I just want to say Oh, oh talk about what I felt. felt yeah, when, when when you talk about when you fell and backwards and you're going to take those pictures. And I want to say from the depth of my heart how greatly sorry I am for those chords <laughs> that were not taped down. It's but okay. You, believe me it was a huge 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 learning experience that so many levels of us learned from <laughs> of that so uh, thank you for accepting our apology yeah. and thank you for like being here with me no matter how, how crazy of your experience might have been while you were on Mulberry Mountain no, um, I honestly my backwoods set was amazing it was like one of my favorites of the summer um I consider that just, you know, it's going to happen to you at some point in your career. I feel like maybe I just got it out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the only time it happens for sure, girl. Was that your first time on Mulberry Mountain? No, I did it last year. No, wait. I played the main stage. I can't this is only, I was only, this is only my second this is going to be my second round as the event director. So I was, I wasn't the event director in 2021. So I don't have the lineup memorized. Were you there then too? It was 2021. Okay. I was trying to remember if it was before the pandemic. It was definitely after. Okay. Then yeah. it would have been 2021 because we went from 2021. Okay. So just out of curiosity, has, have you experienced any of the Mulberry Mountain magic or have you gone straight from your hotel to your set back to your hotel? No, I actually got to hang out um, for a little bit both times. Like I stayed around this past year, um, or this past summer. Um, I got to see of the trees set. I got to see um, who else? Andy Frasco and somebody else. <laughs> Can't remember that far, but yeah, I actually got to walk around, and I the I love backwoods and like summer camp and all of these like the more midwestern vibes festivals is because there's so many people that end up there that like all my friends are there and those feel like the family festivals to me like those are the ones that I want to stick around and hang out and like go get into mischief with you know so it was cool I actually did have time and I and I built that in I could have taken an earlier shuttle but I was like this is the one I'm gonna hang out Oh, I love to hear that. I love to hear that because, you know, Walker Roos had changed my life. And so I like threw myself at Backwoods whenever I heard that they were moving to Mulberry Mountain. And yeah. I love to hear that you take some time to enjoy her, her beauty and her magic because she's, yeah. she's definitely generous with it. If you take time to pause there. Yeah, I actually did uh walker in 2013 with my old project so it definitely had a little bit of that nostalgia as well because that was that was the first festival that i think was outside of colorado that i got to go experience and hang out for the whole weekend so i remembered that being there too that was swamp Arusa. that was one of the few walkers that i didn't go to i took a year off and then i heard that everybody was covered Wait. in mud all weekend Okay, well, maybe it wasn't 2013 then, because it wasn't the it wasn't it wasn't the Swamp Arusa. Okay, okay, so there, so 2014, and then the last year was 2015 of the right. last. It might, been, it might have been 14 then. Okay, cool, cool. Well, then I I didn't stumble upon that. I didn't stumble upon you then. I was obviously supposed to know this project and not and not the the previous yeah. one. So, <laughs> so before we say goodbye. Is yeah. there anything that you would like to share from your heart directly to the Backwoods community while you have their attention? Um, I am just more and more grateful every day that to see how much goes into events and, you know, big festivals like that. My, my, 
actual manager is part of um, Gem and Jam and Cascade. So like I see a lot of what goes on in the back end. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that's involved in all of the small ways, because um, I know it takes a village to make things like that happen and to create spaces for all of us to hang out in that feel so magical. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that there's a, there's an army of people fighting for these spaces for people to feel safe in. Oh, thank you for that. Are yeah. there any last words that you would like to share just with the ethers as far as you, your career or anything you want to plug any shameless plugs you want to give? Before? Uh, <laughs> um, I still have a good amount of dates left this year. Um, a big one that is on my mind right now is my biggest headline to date, which is going to be December 1st at the Ogden in Denver. Um, so yeah, we are little less than a month out from that. And I'm going to put everything that I have into that show. It's going to be very special. So if you're in the Colorado area or not, and just want to dip on over for a weekend, um, yeah or wherever you're at, check my schedule. I will be bopping around for the rest of the year. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. That's so exciting. Guys, friends, please <laughs> go check out Maddie on social media. Go check her out live. Go see her shows. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. We appreciate y'all. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Bye.